So this is this year. Um, we go there every five years, and you can really see that it's melting. And this is a problem. I don't even know where to stand here. <laughs> this is a problem uh, that I really feel in, in my heart. And every time I hear about the climate crisis and, and uh, the problems that we face as humanity, I start to panic, I must admit. I, I, I feel it right now. I'm like, oh, that was tough. That was tough. There's a lot of hope, but it's still tough. And more tough for me because I am a contributor to the climate crisis. I studied something that people would call this contributes to climate change. It's not oil and gas industry or, or all these things. I am an engineer. And as engineers, we, we make solutions to problems. But sometimes we make more problems than we solve. This is something that I think about every day, and it, it, it really is uh, a personal uh, journey. And I invite, if you're in the engineering field, don't block out what we're facing today. Embrace it, panic, talk, to it, talk about it to your friends, um, but, but really try to change uh, yourself. So, I'll let you read through this. It's a bit more technical, but what is air pollution? So the climate emergency is all about CO2 and the, the, the greenhouse effect, and that's going to kill us as humanity if we don't do anything about it. It will, for sure. But it's very indirect, right? It's the Earth that will heat up. And that. Sure, we, we made it heat up, but it's the Earth that's going to kill us. Air pollution comes in many forms, CO2, CO, uh, ozone, and so too. But the most harmful, and this is very direct, it's something we produce thanks to our modern lifestyle, thanks to cars, factories, coal, it's particulate matter. Very, very tiny specks of crap in the air. Rubber from tires, from, uh, from uh, I don't even know how to say it in English, from ashes. Many different things count for particulate matter. And there's two sizes. There's the less dangerous 10 micron particulates and the more dangerous 2.5 micron you can see the comparison to, to human hair. Why is it so dangerous? Because if you breathe it in, it stays in your body. Sometimes it stays there forever. And you know when something stays in your body, it interferes with uh, the way your DNA might be replicated, there might be mutations going on, and that can lead to cancer. That's just one way of, of this harming. In the EU, we have a, or not only in the EU, we have everywhere uh, uh, a, uh, you say this, a, a limit how much air pollution is allowed, how much particulate matter is allowed. So compared to China and the US, the EU is more conservative. And we need to fight it. So there is a few ways to do so. And one way, like always, is to raise awareness. Today we have no clear way of knowing how polluted is our air. We know the temperature, we know the humidity, but we have no clue, necessarily, in our home or in our workplace, how bad is the air we're breathing. Just the other day, when I was working on the air pollution sensors, I was at a friend's place inside he has a he has a big uh, like an open space in his in his apartment and the air smelled fine it was, it was actually quite good but he smokes e-cigarettes indoors and you would think well it's less harmful than a cigarette i turned on the sensor and the readings were 10 times as high as outdoors 
And I thought the sensor was actually broken, but no, it wasn't broken, it was telling the truth. So just knowing how your air quality is around you might lead to a bit of a different uh, behavior. Once, you've, once you know what's, what's around you, you can also stop driving a car because you know, I don't want to contribute to this problem. I want to maybe ride a bicycle or walk to work, and so on and so forth. So where do we come in? I told you I, I, I'm an engineer. I started as a maker. I started in, in, uh, in the lab of, of Dirk as uh, a student assistant. And I did a lot of programming, and something really fascinated me about Dirk's approach to open innovation and uh, like bottom-up initiatives, participatory initiatives. And uh, I started my own makerspace. Thanks to the help of Dirk and the encouragement of Dirk, we proceeded to uh, then found a company from that. Just because we were managing to make actual <laughs> solutions together with the makers involved, and these solutions wanted to be used by other people. That's how uh, EK Zurich approached us again to professionalize these air quality sensors for the climate system. We are a Planet Instruments. I'm Sam, and uh, we do electrical engineering. That's that's our thing. And I'm gonna just gonna go through this. That's what we do. We build those green boards that are in every single device. You own multiple of these for sure. If it's in your washing machine or your coffee machine or your smartphone, you own these devices. And these devices contribute to pollution just as cars, just as planes. That's why I say I contribute to the climate crisis. A hundred percent. And, and it's really hard to, to figure out how to do this in a sustainable way when the whole world is doing it in an unsustainable way. So we focus on little things. We focus on things that are not going to be produced in millions and then land in a landfill, end up in a landfill. We focus on impact, impactful projects that can give scientists better data. One of these projects was a solar-powered uh, rover. So it's a robot on four wheels that has uh, many different environmental sensors. It has a laser scanner in the front. Uh, everything is, uh, all the mechanics are 3D printed, and it's a very low-cost platform. So very low-impact platform. This was used in Antarctica in 2016 together uh, snow surface rugosity data, and this data is used by the scientists there to see how the Antarctic ice sheet migrates. Then another project that we do is an uh, owl monitoring device. So in western Switzerland, or also in, in the Swiss German part, there's a specific uh, species of owls that lives in these wooden boxes. It's called a barn owl. So farmers put these boxes out uh, in front of their field, and the owl then comes there, it, it starts living there, it literally likes to live there, instead of a tree or whatever. And the farmers want this to happen because the owl contributes to pest control. So instead of using pesticides, they use the little owl. And it's a very fascinating species, and today the only way that scientists have to study this uh, species is to go to the box and open it manually. And there's 400 of these, and they drive to each and every one of these boxes because you can't take the bus. So what we're doing is we're making a little a device that measures the weight, it measures the identity, the temperature, and all these things about the owl, and transmits it in real time to the cloud. That way, the scientist can just sit in, in the office chair and, and watch the data for it. Who are we? So we're all makers. We all started uh, basically on, 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 from nothing. We have no investors and we're not looking for investors, particularly because we don't want to be pressured by someone who tells us, oh, you should go to a conference in Sydney and uh, then come back on the next day. That's the way to do things. If you follow the startup ecosystem, 
you will learn a certain way of, uh, of, of uh, performing, and that is not something that we want to uh, we want to be identified with, because that is what is contributing very deeply to the climate crisis. We focus on small things that can become into a very impactful scientific project. So we, we start with the researcher who has some kind of idea but doesn't really know how to put it into, into, a, into a finished uh, prototype and then finish the actual experiment or product. So we go through the full, uh, full phases. And now how does Climate City Cup come in? So, when Climate City Cup approached us, you had uh, a couple of components, these components here. They're different sensors. So the, the top one where it says U-Blocks, that's a GPS module. The green thing is a air particle sensor. And the black thing, that's a temperature and humidity sensor. These are all what we call in the electronic industries components. They have manufacturers, and the manufacturers don't give anything else other than the, the block. And what an electrical engineer needs to do is he needs to, or she needs to take the, those components and put them together and make it into a box like this, or a box like this, or a box like this. All these boxes, they are contained, they contain components. And the whole, the thing that happens in the brain is how do you put them in, in and how do you actually do that physically? Well, you get this green board, which is called a PCB. You design it, you spend some hours to do that, and then you put them, put the components on top. There's a specific process, which I won't go into detail, but that's how you do it. And so the idea was, instead of making a finished product like this, like a, a, something you could sell in uh, into discount or Libro or whatever, Instead of doing that, let's make something that is a basis for makers and hackers to build upon. The basis needs to be working well. It needs to provide the things that are maybe too, too specific for a hacker or maker to know, something that requires a bit more expertise to, to complete. And uh, put that on one board. So this board, which is in uh, the middle, the printed circuit board, it connects and powers all the components that I showed you before. It can charge a battery, it allows programming, and it is uh, friendly to hackers and makers. This means it supports all the, the details and protocols that we as hackers are familiar with. Of course, low cost. Making things low cost, I hear this all the time, low cost this, low cost that. Making things low cost is very difficult. The reason why you can afford this PowerPoint presenter is because it's produced in the millions. It's produced in extremely large quantities. So making something actually low cost is extremely difficult. I say this because maybe we should not focus on that too much in the future if we want to solve the, the problem of, of uh, climate change and the whole way we do business. Maybe we should instead focus on building something extremely good that has a uh, very high quality that might cost triple than what you expect but it lasts a very long time and maybe the technology is also open maybe it's open source the software that runs it is freely editable and that way the lifetime of a product is extremely long because it can take on different forms it can be edited it can be modified and that's what we wanted to achieve here we wanted to make a device that senses air pollution, the particulate matter that you're breathing in. It should tell you that number, but it should also allow you to add other things. Let's say you wanted to add a solar panel. Well, you could do so. You could follow a little tutorial and then add your own solar panel, which is not evident in the case of a PowerPoint presenter because the manufacturer doesn't allow you to do that. The manufacturer even makes it difficult to open it. So we wanted to make it as open as possible. And of course, license it under an open source license as well. What does that 
look like. So the actual products that we have developed so far, uh, you, you can go look at it at the table, but it's that green board. It's the other green component here. And something unusual, the battery. Battery is not included. One of the major problems we have today is lithium ion batteries. They're going, I mean, there's a huge impact that lithium and cobalt production has on, on uh, many societies around the planet. And there's a huge waste of lithium ion batteries and batteries in general. So we wanted to tell to any maker who wants to use this air quality uh, sensor board, they have to supply their own. And if you look around at home, you probably have one or two old phone batteries. And they're still perfectly good. Maybe not for the Nokia phone from uh, 10 years ago, but uh, for, for this and for other devices like it, you can reuse it. So we also will provide a little tutorial on how to reuse the battery. In fact, if you, if you look here, this is an old Motorola battery from probably, I don't know how, how long ago, but it's Fatima's old phone. So we want to really make sure that people are aware, yes, there's a cool device. The cool device can help them know the air quality in their room and, and maybe uh, reduce the cancer risk because they open up the window more. But it also should show them, this is electronics in 2019. It has an impact, but we together, as consumers and producers of electronics, and, and it's very important because we carry multitudes of electronics today around us, with us, we as producers and consumers can change by informing ourselves. We can tell the manufacturer, no, we don't want the battery. We already have batteries at home. Or no, we don't need a plastic case. We can use no case at all. We can put it in a, in a bag. Why do we need a fancy design case? We can make our own case. We can use a cardboard case. There are so many options. We just have to be, or we, we shouldn't be intimidated by trying to understand what goes inside a product. Be it this microphone, be it that owl, be it the iPhone, the laptop, your camera you're using, this presenter, it doesn't matter, but we should ask the question, what is inside of our devices? So, uh, what are the next steps? I, I'm, I'm not going to do the demo because it's kind of, it's hard to do from here. But you can see it on the table later. This is the, the final device that we have made uh, so far. Um, we have followed our instincts and we have made a case. We were strongly against making a, a plastic case, but it is true that if you do want to make an impression, some, the product that you're making has to look good. And today, whenever we stand in front of an audience, we do want to make an impression. But uh, I'm telling you now, making cases, making good designs, they cost resources, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So we only made one. The next steps that we have in front of us. The green board and the collection of components, the batteries and all that stuff, it's not enough to make a device. A device in 2019 also runs software. It runs, runs a lot of software. It has potentially even an app that goes with it or a website, some kind of cloud server, something like that. And we need participants, we need uh, volunteers who can help us do this software development. And we will be publishing on the website of Climate City Cup probably as well, a call to action uh, for a hackathon on uh, making the software for this, uh, for this device. And with that, I conclude. Uh, I'm Sam, and if you have any questions, please get in touch. I speak auch Deutsch, von dem her könnt ihr mich auch auf Deutsch ansprechen. And uh, yeah, otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>